and welcome. My name is Alan, and today we are back with more tales of Greek mythology here. Yeah, this is supposed to be Thursday's video, but I am behind. But, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll try to get things moving here. We get into the actual pre-gods. The primeval forces here, so let's jump into this. Part 1, The Gods, The Creation, and The Earliest Heroes. Strange, clouded fragments of an ancient glory. Late lingerers of the company divine. They breathe of that far world where from they come uh, last halls of heaven and Olympian air. The Greeks did not believe that the gods created the universe. It was the other way about the universe created the gods. Before there were gods, heaven and earth had been formed. They were the first parents. The titans were, the, were their children, and the gods were their grandchildren. The titans and the twelve great Olympians. The titans, often called the elder gods, were for untold ages supreme in the universe. They were of enormous size and incredible strength. There were many of them, but only a few appear in the stories of mythology. The most important was Cronus, in Latin, Saturn. He ruled over the other titans until his son Zeus dethroned him and seized the power for himself. The Romans said that when Jupiter, their name for Zeus, ascended the throne, Saturn fled to Italy and brought in the Golden Age, a time of perfect peace and happiness which lasted as long as he reigned. The other notable titans were Ocean, the river that was supposed to encircle the earth. His wife, Tethys, Hyperion, the father of the sun, the moon, and the dawn, uh... Nemocene, which means memory, uh, Themis, usually translated uh, by justice, and Iapetus, important because of his son's Atlas, who bore the world on his shoulder, and Prometheus, who was the savior of mankind. These alone among the older gods were not banished with the coming of Zeus, but they took a lower place. The twelve great Olympians were supreme among the gods who succeeded to the Titans. They were called the Olympians because Olympus was their home. What Olympus was, however, is not easy to say. There is no doubt that at first it was held to be a mountaintop and generally identified with Greece's highest mountain, Mount Olympus, in Thessaly, in the northeast of Greece. But even... In the earliest Greek poem, the Iliad, this idea 
is beginning to give way to the idea of an Olympus in some mysterious region far above all the mountains of the earth. In one passage of the Iliad, Zeus talks to the gods from the topmost peak of many ridged Olympus, clearly a mountain. But only a little further on, he says that if he willed, he could hang earth from and sea from a, a pinnacle of Olympus. Clearly no longer a mountain. Even so, it is not heaven. Homer makes Poseidon say that he rules the sea, Hades the dead, Zeus the heaven, but Olympus is a is common to all three. Whenever wherever it was, the entrance to it was a great gate of clouds kept by the seasons. Within were the gods' dwellings where they lived and slept and feasted on ambrosia and nectar and listened to Apollo's lyre. It was an abode of perfect blessedness. No wind, Homer says, ever shakes the untroubled peace of Olympus. No rain ever falls there or snow. But the cloudless firmament stretches around it on all sides, and the white glory of sunshine is diffused upon its walls. The twelve Olympians made up a divine family. Zeus, or Jupiter, the chief, his two brothers next, Poseidon, or Neptune, Hades, also called Pluto, Hestia, or Vesta, their sister, Hera, or Juno, Zeus's wife, and Ares, or Mars, their son, Zeus's children, Athena, or Minerva, Apollo, Aphrodite, or Venus, Hermes, or Mercury, and Artemis, or Diana, and Hera's son, Hephaestus, or Vulcan, sometimes said to be the son of Zeus, too. Zeus, or Jupiter. Zeus and his brothers drew lots for their share of the universe. The sea fell to Poseidon and the underworld to Hades. Zeus became the supreme ruler. He was the lord of the sky, the rain god, and the cloud gatherer who decided the who wielded the awful thunderbolt. His power was greater than that of all the other divinities together. In the Iliad, he tells his family, I am mightiest of all. Make trial that you may know. Fasten a rope of gold to heaven and lay hold every god and goddess. You could not drag down Zeus, but if I wished to drag you down, then I would. The rope I would build to a pinnacle, to, would bind to a pinnacle of Olympus, and all would hang in the air. Yes, the very earth and sea, too. Nevertheless, he was not omnipotent or omniscient either. He could be opposed and deceived. Poseidon dupes him in the Iliad and so does Hera. Sometimes, um, to the mysterious power, fate is spoken of as stronger than he. Homer makes Hera ask him scornfully if he proposes to deliver 
from death a man fate has doomed. He is represented as falling in love with one woman after another and, and descending to all manner of tricks to hide his infidelity from his wife. The explanation why such actions were ascribed to, to the most majestic of the gods is, the scholars say, that Zeus, the Zeus of song and story, has been made by combining many gods. When his, sense, when his worship spread to a town where there was already a divine ruler, the two were slowly fused into one. The wife of the early god was then transferred to Zeus. The result, however, was fortunate, and later Greeks did not like uh, these endless love affairs. Still, even in the earliest record, Zeus had grandeur. In the Iliad, Agamemnon prays, Zeus, most glorious, most great, God of the storm cloud, thou that dwellest in the heavens, he demanded two not only sacrifices from men, but right action. The Greek army at Troy is told, Father Zeus never helps liars or those who break their oaths. The two ideas of him, the low and the high, persisted side by side for a long time. His breastplate was the aegis, awful to behold, his bird was the eagle, his tree the oak. His oracle was Dodona in the land of oak trees. The god's will was revealed by the uh, rustling of the oak leaves which the priests interpreted. Hera or Juno. She was Zeus's wife and sister. The Titans, Ocean, and Tethys brought her up. She was the protector of marriage, and married women were her uh, peculiar care. There is very little that is uh, attractive in the portrait the poets draw of her. She is called, indeed, in an early poem, Golden-Throned Hera, among immortals the queen, chief among them in beauty the, the glorious lady. All the blessed in high Olympus revere, honor even as Zeus, the lord of the thunder. But when any account of her gets down to details, it shows her chiefly engaged in punishing the many women Zeus fell in love with, even when they yielded only because he coerced or tricked them. It made no difference to Hera how reluctant any of them were and how innocent. The goddess threatened them all alike. Her implacable anger followed them and their children too. She never forgot an injury. The Trojan War would have ended in an honorable peace, leaving both sides unconquered if it had not been for her hatred of a Trojan who had judged another goddess lovelier than she. The wrong had slighted beauty, uh, the wrong of her slighted beauty, remained with her until Troy fell in ruins. In one important story, the 
quest of the Golden Fleece, she is the gracious protector of heroes and the inspirer of, in, of heroic deeds, but not in any other. Nevertheless, she was venerated in every home. She was the goddess married women turned to for help. Uh, Elithia or Elithia who helped women in childbirth was her daughter. The cow and the peacock were sacred to her. Argos was her favorite city. Poseidon or Neptune. He was the ruler of the sea, Zeus's brother and second only to him in eminence. The Greeks on both sides of the Aegean were uh, seamen, and the god of the sea was all important to them. His wife was Amphiridae, uh, a granddaughter of the Titan Ocean. Poseidon had a splendid palace beneath the sea, but he was oftener to be found in Olympus. Besides being lord of the sea, he gave the first house to man and was honored as much for the one as the other. Lord Poseidon from you, this pride is ours. The strong horses, the young horses, and the rule of the deep. Storm and calm were under his control. He commanded, and the storm wind rose, and the surges of the sea. But when he drove in an golden car over the waters, the thunder of the waves sank into stillness, and the tranquil peace followed his smooth rolling wheels. He was commonly called Earthshaker, and was always shown carrying his trident, a three-pronged spear with which he would shake and shatter whatever he pleased. He had some connection with bulls as well as with horses, and the bull was connected with many other gods too. Hades or Pluto he was the third brother among the Olympians who drew for his share the underworld and the rule over, over the dead. He was also called Pluto, the god of wealth, of the precious metals hidden in the earth. The Romans, as well as the Greeks, called him by his name, but often they translated it into dis, the Latin word for rich. He had a far-famed cap or helmet which made whoever wore it invisible. It was rare that he left his dark realm to visit Olympus or the earth nor was he urged to do so. He was not a welcome visitor. He was unpitying, inexorable, but just a terrible, not an evil god. His wife was Persephone, uh, whom he carried away from the earth and made queen of the lower world. He was king of the dead, not death himself, 
whom the Greeks called Thanatos and the Romans Orcus. Pallas Athena or Minerva. She was the daughter of Zeus alone, no mother bore her. Full grown and in full armor, she sprang from his head. In the earliest account of her, the Iliad, she is a fierce and ruthless battle goddess, but elsewhere she is a war she is warlike only to defend the state and the home from outside enemies. She was preeminently the goddess of the city, the protector of civilized life, of handicrafts and agriculture, the inventor of the bridal and the first um, tamed horses for men to use. She was Zeus's favorite child. He trusted her to carry the awful Aegis, his buckler, and his devastating weapon, the thunderbolt. The word oftenest used to describe her is gray-eyed, or as it is sometimes translated, flashing-eyed. Of the three virgin goddesses, she was the chief and was called the maiden Parthenos uh, and her temple the Parthenon. In later poetry, she is the embodiment of the uh, uh, she is the embodiment of wisdom. Uh, reason and purity. Uh, Athens was her special city and the olive was created by her was her tree, the owl her bird. Phoebus Apollo the son of Zeus and Leto born in the little island of Delos. He has been called the most Greek of all the gods. He is a beautiful figure in Greek poetry, the master musician who delights Olympus as he plays on his golden lyre. The lord, too, of the silver uh, bow the archer god, far shooting, the healer, as well who first taught men the healing art. Even more than of these good and lovely endowments, he is the god of light, in whom is no darkness at all, and so he is the god of truth. No false words ever fall from his lips. O Phoebus, from your throne of truth, from your dwelling place at the heart of the world, you speak to men. Uh, by Zeus's decree, no lie comes there. No shadow to darken the world, the word of truth. Zeus sealed, er, sealed by an everlasting right. Apollo's honor that all may trust. With unshaken faith when he speaks. Delphi, under towering uh, Parnassus, where Apollo's oracle was, 
plays an important part in mythology. Castalia was its sacred spring. Um, Cephasus, its river. It was held to be the center of the world. So many pilgrims came to it from foreign countries as well as Greece. No other shrine rivaled it. The answers to the questions asked by the anxious seekers for truth were delivered by a priest who went into a trance before she spoke. The trance was supposed to be caused by a vapor rising from a deep cleft in the rock over which her seat was placed. A three-legged stool, the tripod. Apollo was called Delian from Delos, the island of his birth, the, and Pythian from his killing of a serpent, Python, which once lived in the caves of Parnassus. It was a frightful monster and was the mightiest, or, and the contest was severe, but in the end, the gods unerring arrows won the victory. Another name often came, uh, often given to him was the Lycian, uh, variously explained as meaning wolf god, god of light, the god of Lycia. In the Iliad, he is called the Menthian, the mouse god, out. But whether he protected mice or he destroyed them, no one knows. Often he was the sun god too. His name, uh, Phobus or Phoebus, means brilliant or shining. Accurately, however, the sun god was Helios, child of the Titan Hyperion. Apollo at Delphi was much, was a purely ben beneficent power, a direct link between gods and men, guiding men to know the divine will, showing them how to make peace with the gods. And he was the purifier, too, able to cleanse even those stained with the blood of their kindred. Nevertheless, there was a few tales told of him which show him pitiless and cruel. Two ideas were fighting in him as in all the gods, a primitive, crude idea, and one that was beautiful and poetic. In him, only a little of the primitive is left. The laurel was his tree. Many creatures were sacred to him, chief among them the dolphin and the crow. I'll go ahead and end this episode there. So, yeah. We start seeing a few of the gods. Getting to know them. And we see that the gods themselves did not start. First, you have the primeval forces, earth, ocean, or earth and sea, but they would give birth to the titan. So, yeah, and this becomes a famous, one of the biggest moments of Greek history, the 
um, the gods fight the titans to take control of the universe. Um, shoot, what is the name of that movie? It may be Jason and the Argonauts is what I'm thinking of. Them. Um, you often see them referring, uh, they'll talk a lot about the gods, but uh, there's a few mention of the Titans. Uh, but yeah. The Titan Cronus is the father of these gods, but fearing they will surpass him, you know, he swallows them. But of course, Zeus is not swallowed. And so he's allowed to grow to adulthood. He comes back and frees his brothers and sisters from the belly of Cronus. But yeah. And we get a look particularly at some of the gods to begin with. Um, we get an idea of Zeus, Hera, Poseidon, Hades, Pallas Athena. It might be, I don't, uh, it might just be Phobos Apollo instead of Phoebus. It, uh, Greek's one of the languages I didn't learn to speak. Actually, there's a lot of languages I never learned to speak, even though I wanted to. <sighs> but, yeah. So we get to look at the gods, who they were, how they were, yeah, Zeus, Hera, Apollo, Athena, Athena is one of those unusual gods that she wasn't born of the union of male and female, but sprang forth from the head of her father, Zeus. And you'll find other gods and goddesses that are birthed unusually um, Aphrodite I think was born of sea foam if I remember it right so we'll get to that in a bit but yeah but yeah it's a good start we get to see some of the How so? How some of the tales start to unfold. But thank you all for watching. As always, educate thyself. Think, read, study, learn. Someone tries to tell you something you have trouble believing. Ask them to cite their sources. I'll see you all in the next one. Until then, later.